Welcome to lesson one of the Decisions During Uncertainty toolset, Risk Profiles. This lesson describes how to create a risk profile that will help you to think through a decision containing uncertainty. Once you've created your risk profile, you'll be able to make sense of the different outcomes that may arise, their likelihoods of occurring, and the consequences each outcome can have if selected. The lesson consists of this presentation together with a lesson guide to help you create your own risk profile. The lesson guide includes an example risk profile that forms the case study used in this lesson. It would be useful to have a copy of the risk profile in front of you as you watch the lesson. Ideally, you should have watched the lessons contained in the PROACT toolset to gain the full benefits of this course. Uncertainty. Not knowing what the consequences are until after we've made a decision, brings a new level of complexity to decision making. In the example that follows, we'll see that a single decision between two alternatives contains a number of uncertainties, each with differing outcomes and consequences, that without a systematic method for untangling all the complexity, will make reaching a good decision difficult. Before we look at how to build a risk profile, it's worth taking a moment to consider what's meant by a good decision. More often than not, we judge our decision based on the consequences of that decision, that is, how things turn out. The problem is, we can make good decisions that have bad consequences, as well as bad decisions with good consequences. For example, we plan a summer wedding, and on the happy day, just after the service, and when the photographs outside the church are about to be taken, it starts to rain quite unexpectedly. Good decision, but bad and unexpected consequence. Alternatively, we spend one pound on a lottery ticket and win the jackpot. Buying a ticket is a bad decision because of the extremely low chances of winning, but the consequence is extremely good if our ticket has the winning numbers. Using a sound process to identify and understand the uncertainties involved will help us to recognise the risks associated with our decision. Then, based on our risk tolerance, something that is discussed in Lesson 2, we can then make a good and informed decision. A risk profile captures the way uncertainty affects one or more of the alternatives on which our decision is based. It's built using answers to these four questions. What are the key uncertainties? What are the possible outcomes of these uncertainties? What are the chances of occurrence for each outcome? And what are the consequences of each outcome? Step 1. What are the key uncertainties? Franny Smith's divorce has just come through. Faced with a small alimony payment, her 17-year-old daughter Sandy, who's due to attend university next year, and savings of just £3,000, Franny must decide between her two alternatives – to downsize and move from a five-bedroom house to something smaller before Sandy starts university, or stay where she is. Franny's decision objectives include having sufficient money to support Sandy's university education, having sufficient money to maintain the same quality of life she enjoyed before her divorce, and having financial peace of mind for the next three years so that she can concentrate on developing her part-time business into a full-time one. However, Franny's having difficulty reaching a decision because of the uncertainties surrounding her alternatives. The first thing that Franny needs to do is to list all the uncertainties that could significantly influence the consequences for each of her alternatives. When it comes to her first alternative, remaining in her current home, Franny realises that there are three things on her mind. 1. Whether she will be happy in her current home, surrounded by reminders of her marriage. 2. Whether Sandy will want to stay with her when she starts university. And 3. Whether she would be able to have the same standard of living due to the remaining mortgage and cost of maintaining the house. The second thing that Franny needs to do is to determine how the possible outcomes of each uncertainty would affect a decision. Regarding her first uncertainty about being happy, Franny feels that one way of ridding herself of the uncertainty 
is to either store or give away those objects that would cause her pain. Doing this would reduce the outcome of her being unhappy while living in the same house. Applying this approach, Franny no longer needs to consider this uncertainty. Franny asks Sandy about her plans for university and whether she would want some independence or would be happy to continue living at home. With the university only a bus ride away and being happy living with her mum, Sandy tells Franny that she has no plans to move out. So having spoken to Sandy, Franny can remove this uncertainty. Her third uncertainty, not knowing whether she would be able to maintain the same standard of living if she remained in the same house, causes Franny significant concern because of what could happen if she couldn't pay her bills and the mortgage. This is an uncertainty she will have to investigate further. Franny now turns her attention to a second alternative, downsizing to a smaller home. As before, she identifies those uncertainties that could influence her alternative significance. The uncertainties she identifies include whether or not she could find a suitable home in the same area, and not knowing if she would be able to get a good enough price for her current home in the next 12 months to be able to make downsizing worthwhile. The next thing for Franny to do is to determine how the outcomes of each uncertainty will affect her decision. After visiting a number of property websites, Franny realises that the ideal home for her and Sandy would be a two-bedroom home and that there are a number of these available in her area. So this uncertainty is something she no longer needs to worry about. Whether or not she would get a good price for her current home in the next 12 months is more of a problem for Franny, since the more she can sell it for, the greater her financial peace of mind. This consequence, she decides, will require further consideration. When identifying your key uncertainties, identify as many as you can, then work to find ways of removing them. For example, just as Franny did, obtain information so that you can reduce some or all of the unknowns you're dealing with. Another way of managing uncertainty is to find ways to remove it. When Franny worried about objects around the house reminding her of her marriage, removing the objects reduced the likelihood of this happening. One other way of reducing uncertainty is to transfer it. Taking out insurance is an example of transferring the uncertainty of an unpleasant outcome to someone else, albeit at a price. When we remove such uncertainties, we can then focus on those whose outcomes are significant enough to influence our decision making. Step 2. Define the outcomes for each uncertainty. The second step for creating a risk profile is to define the outcomes for each uncertainty. Defining outcomes involves obtaining answers to two questions. 1. How many outcomes are there for this uncertainty? And 2. What is the best way to describe each outcome? When it comes to answering the question, how many outcomes are there for this uncertainty, bear in mind that you could be facing just two outcomes. For example, rain or shine for a wedding day. Or you could face more than two, for instance, different levels of return on investment. Using a scale such as low, medium and high is a great way of describing an outcome. Equally, a range may also work, so that those low, medium and high returns might be described by ranges such as 1 to 3,000 pounds, 4 to 6,000 pounds and 7 to 10,000 pounds. When describing a range, and if you want to keep things simple, you could always use a stand-in for the range, such as 2,000 pounds for the 1 to 3,000 pound range, 5,000 pounds for the 4 to 6,000 pound range and so on. Whether you use numbers or ratings, make sure that what you use describes the outcome in as concise a way as possible. Sometimes that might involve writing a description as well. Wherever possible, keep your list of outcomes short to avoid complexity. As in the case of a low, medium or high return on an investment, in some situations you need only consider low and high returns. Whatever your outcomes, make sure that they fulfil these three requirements. 1. They're mutually exclusive. 
each of your outcomes differs from the others, for example profit and loss. 2. They're exhaustive. That is, they cover all eventualities, for instance profit, loss or break even. And 3. They're unambiguously defined, so that you're clear which outcome is assigned to what uncertainty. For example, profit, loss or break even are assigned to the uncertainty of getting a return on an investment compared to the uncertainty of getting a good rate of interest from a deposit account. Having identified her key uncertainties, being able to maintain the same standard of living if she decides on staying where she is, and getting a good price for my home in the next 12 months, which is based on the alternative to downsize, Franny now turns her attention to their possible outcomes. When considering whether she'll be able to maintain the same standard of living, Franny decides that there are three possible outcomes. A good outcome, a poor one, and a bad outcome. While they're mutually exclusive and exhaustive, she decides to add some description to them to avoid any ambiguity. She then does the same for her uncertainty of getting a good price. Step 3. Assign chances. The next step in developing a risk profile is to determine the chance of each outcome occurring. For the purpose of making decisions during uncertainty, chance is thought of as the likelihood of an outcome occurring and this likelihood is expressed as a percentage. If a weather forecast predicts a 60% chance of rain, this is the same as saying that there is a 60 in 100 chance of rain. The higher the percentage, the greater the certainty or confidence that an outcome will occur. The lower the percentage, the lower the confidence or certainty in the outcome occurring. When working with alternatives that have more than one outcome, the sum of the chances for all the outcomes must add up to 100%. So if the weather outcomes for the alternative of a summer wedding are rain and sunshine, and we figure that the chance of rain on the day is 60%, the chance of sunshine must be 40%. Similarly, if we were to refine our summer wedding alternative to include a third weather outcome, a cloudy day, and then assign this a 10% likelihood, the chances of sunshine would then be 30% if the chance of rain remained at 60%. At the end of this step, we'll discuss five ways of deciding what the likelihood of an outcome might be. Franny looks at each of the outcomes for her first alternative, to stay where she is. Thinking about the monthly income she has coming in from her new business and her alimony, and comparing these against her monthly bills and outgoings, she realises that the chances of her having a good outcome are poor. While a business shows promise, it won't make her sufficient money quickly enough for her income to match or exceed her outgoings. Based on these thoughts, Franny estimates a 5% chance of a good outcome. Using the same thinking, Franny decides that she has a 30% chance of realising a poor outcome. Since 5 and 30 add up to 35%, the final outcome, the bad outcome, must therefore be 65% likely to occur. Although depressing to think about, this figure feels right to Franny. In order to assign chances to the outcomes of her second alternative, downsize, Franny does some homework first. She searches the internet for websites that list the sales of properties in her area to learn what kind of price she could ask for a home. She also invites three estate agents to view a property and to get a price estimate. She's pleased to learn that due to the location of her property, she could realise a price that was at the high end of the price range she had found on the internet. Armed with this knowledge, Franny assigns a 60% chance to her high outcome, a 30% chance to her average, and a 10% to her low outcome. When assigning chances to your outcomes, here are five things that you can do to help you develop an accurate probability. 1. Use your judgement. This is something that we do every day based on our knowledge and experience. If you feel that your knowledge or experience is lacking, then take a look at the next four tips. 2. 
Consult existing information. This is something that Franny did when she visited websites containing the prices of homes sold in her area. 3. Collect new data. If Franny were to ask her friends how much they would be willing to pay for her house, this would be one way of collecting new data. While this approach is not so relevant to Franny's situation, yours might require you to go out and ask the right people in a similar way to the market research that companies do when they don't have the information they need. 4. Ask experts. Bringing estate agents in for estimates was Franny's way of asking experts so that the chances she assigned her outcomes were accurate. 5. Break down the uncertainty into its component parts. Before she assigned chances to her outcomes for maintaining the same standard of living, Franny looked at her income and her costs separately. She worked out what the chances were of making enough money and then the likelihood of her different monthly costs occurring. Comparing these probabilities enabled her to decide on an overall chance for each outcome. Step 4. Clarify the consequences. When we clarify our consequences, we're doing two things. Firstly, we use our decision objectives to help us think about what would happen, the consequences, for each of the outcomes we've identified. And secondly, we describe the consequence. Franny's three objectives are having sufficient money to support Sandy's university education, having sufficient money to maintain the same quality of life she enjoyed before her divorce, and having financial peace of mind for the next three years so that she can concentrate in developing her new business. Using each objective, she explores what the consequence will be for each of the outcomes she identified in step two. For the first outcome of her alternative, stay where I am, Franny considers what it would be like if she were able to maintain the same standard of living as though she was still married. For her first objective, supporting Sandy's university education, she calculates that she would be able to support her daughter with up to £6,000 a year for three years. So £6,000 financial support is the consequence for the good outcome. Having sufficient money to maintain the same quality of life is the next objective, and Franny decides to use a range of same, same quality of life, some, some of her former quality of life, and none, none of her former quality of life, to describe the consequences for this objective. In the case of her first outcome, she works out that she will be able to maintain the same quality of life. For her third objective, financial peace of mind, Franny works out what she would need in savings to be free of worries for the next three years. She decides that having between 15 and 20,000 pounds in the bank will give her complete peace of mind while having between 10 and 14,000 pounds in the bank will give a partial peace of mind. Anything below 10,000 pounds will keep her awake at night. For a first outcome, and only having 3,000 pounds of savings, Franny knows that as a consequence, this will keep her awake at night. Franny now repeats the same process for her second and third outcomes. Poor have to come back on non-essentials, and bad unable to pay the bills. Having worked on a stay where I am alternative, Franny now turns to her downsize alternative. Just as she's done before, she applies each of her three objectives to the outcomes high, average and low, so that she has a consequence for Sandy's university education, quality of life and financial peace of mind. Just as we described in the consequences lesson of the PROACT toolset, we must make sure that the descriptions of our consequences are complete, precise and accurate. Describing our consequences involves one of three approaches. 1. A written description. Sometimes a written description of the consequence is all that's needed. However, as mentioned before, 
we need to make sure we're being as complete, precise and accurate as we can, if we need to explain our decision making to others. 2. A qualitative description. A qualitative description provides more information than a written description because it breaks down the consequence into its constituent parts. In the case study, Franny used same, some and none to describe the kind of quality of life she might have compared to when she was married. 3. A quantitative description. A quantitative description, one that's numerical, is the clearest description to understand. In the case study, Franny uses the money she wants to contribute each year to Sandy's education as a way of describing a consequence. Even though Franny described her financial peace of mind, using terms such as complete and awake at night, these terms were based on financial values, amounts of money, she expected to have deposited in the bank. Franny's decision. Reviewing her risk profile, it's clear to Franny that staying in her current home won't allow her to realise her decision objectives. Studying the chances and their consequences, Franny realises that downsizing has far better prospects. Franny decides to sell a home and downsize. A risk profile helps us to think through a decision that contains uncertainty. Once created, a risk profile will help us to make sense of the different outcomes that may arise, their likelihoods of occurring, and the consequences each outcome can have if selected. So the next time your decision contains consequences that you can't be certain of, build yourself a risk profile.